Praise the Lord. God bless you. My name is Freddie Hidalgo, and this is Exploring God's Word. In this Bible study, we're going to be going over the scriptures that have been transforming millions of people's lives through this specific Bible study for the last few decades. And this is the revised version. This is the updated version. And here we are in 2022, in the last days. And many people need to still come to the knowledge of the fullness of the truth. And understanding of how to rightly divide the word of God. Here in Acts 16.32, they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in the house. In Acts 17.11, they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily. So no matter what you hear from preachers, no matter what you hear when you listen to the radio or you turn on the television or you go to church, make sure you yourself are searching the scriptures daily lest you be deceived. The word of God is truth, but we must saturate ourselves in it daily and not depend on another individual, but we need to search the scriptures ourselves. We're going to be going into the introduction to the Old Testament today. The introduction to the Old Testament, it covers many events over a span of thousands of years. We will divide this time into four periods simply as a way to understand some of the major events better. Now, these time periods are known as innocence, conscience, patriarchs, law and prophets, and we're going to look at each of them briefly. In a sense, it extends from the creation of man to his sin in the Garden of Eden. Now, the length of this time we do not know, but it stems from the beginning of God, God creating man and breathing into his nostrils and him becoming the living soul all the way to the time sin came in. Number two, conscious. Conscious spans the time from the fall of man once he sinned, the original sin, all the way to Abraham. The patriarchs, which is the time of the patriarch, it reaches from Abraham all the way to Moses. We're going to talk about that time. Then we're also going to talk about the law and prophets. Now this time of the law and prophets extends from Moses all the way to Christ. We have to rightly divide the word of truth and look at these different time periods and study them. So our first lesson covers the events from the creation all the way to the first judgment. We're going to be here starting with the books of the Old Testament. The books of the Old Testament, we must understand that the entire Bible is the inspired word of God. It's not just some kind of uh, story somebody wrote somewhere when they were bored, but God himself authored and inspired every word in the scriptures. Second Peter Chapter 1 verse 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Clearly the Old Testament was the inspired word of God. According to 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So it does not even come from man or the carnality of a man, but it's inspired by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. Now, in the Greek language in which the New Testament was written, the word inspired means God breathed. Scripture was not written by the will of men. That is, men did not merely decide to write about God. The Bible is not man's book about God, but God's book to humankind. So a key word in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21 is moved. The word moved in the original language, it means to be carried along, much as a ship is carried over the surface of the sea by the winds blowing its sails, if you get my drift. And let's talk about how the Bible is the Word of God. We should approach our study of the Bible with great reverence because, first of all, it's the Word of God, not the Word of men. Each word is important. God warned Moses, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandment of the Lord your God which I command you. That's Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2. A similar command is found in Proverbs chapter 30 verse 6. And thou, not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Just before 
the close of the Bible, God inspired John to include these words in the book of Revelations. Revelation 22, 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of the, this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So we do not want to ever add or take away to the inspired word of God. Amen. God's word is to be preserved. God did not just give his word to humankind. He promised to preserve it forever so that everyone would have access to God's revelation. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver is tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That's Psalms 12, 6-7. On the same subject of the divine preservation of God's word, Jesus said, And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Luke 16, 17. Now, a tittle is a very small mark in the Hebrew language in which the Old Testament was written. Now, there is an easy method to remember the number of books in the Old Testament. The word old has three letters, O-L-D. The word testament has nine letters. Now, if we put three and nine together, we have 39. The number of books in the Old Testament is 39. Now, the Old Testament was penned by about 32 men as the Holy Spirit moved on them. It spans a period of at least 3,600 years of human history, and it requires about 1,500 years to complete. We can divide its 39 books into four sections. Law, five books. History, 12 books. Poetry, five books. And prophecy, 17 books. The first five usually being called major prophets and the last 12 usually being called minor prophets. The Bible is a powerful book. And a study of it can change the whole perspective of a person's life. In the story of mutiny and bounty, one incident illustrates this point. The mutineers sank their ship and landed with their native women on the lonely island of Pitcairn. Now, there were nine white sailors, six natives, ten women, and a girl of fifteen. One of the sailors knew how to distill alcohol and the island became filled with drunkenness and vice now after a time only one of the sailors was left living surrounded by native women and their children the sailor found a bible in one of the chests taken from the bounty and began teaching it teaching it to the survivors as a result his own life was changed and finally the life of the whole colony now, in 1808, the United States ship Topaz visited the island and found a thriving, prosperous community without whiskey, without crime. So surely the Holy Bible had totally changed the life of the colony. So it has been from age to age. The entrance of thy words giveth light. Psalm 119.30. Praise the Lord. In the beginning, God. Let's talk about the creation week. The first verse of the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1.1 The creation account reveals that God made all things in six days, and on the seventh day, He rested. So, let us examine each day, shall we? Let's talk about the first day. On the first day, God said, Let there be light. Genesis 1 3 and God divided the light from the darkness he called the light day and the darkness night Genesis 1 3 to 5 at this point the earth was still without form and void Genesis 1 2 there existed a mass of waters now let's talk about the second day on the second day God said let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters Genesis 1 6. God called the firmament heaven. Today we call it the sky. This firmament divided the waters into those 
under it and those above it. Genesis 1, 6 through 8. Now, the third day, on the third day, God said, Let the waters under the waters be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. Genesis 1, 9. He called the dry land earth and the gathered waters seas. On the same day, God also said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. Genesis 1.11 So the third day saw the appearance of dry land and the gathering of the waters into specific areas and the creation of the grass, herbs, and trees on the land. Genesis 1, 9-13 The fourth day. On the fourth day, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and for years. And let them be lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. Genesis 1, 14-15 on this day God made the sun, moon, and stars to divide the light from the darkness and to mark days, seasons, and years with their signs. Genesis 1, 14-19 Now the fifth day. On the fifth day God said, Let the waters bring forth abundant the moving creature that hath life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Genesis 1, 20 by his spoken word, God created the great whales and every living creature that moves in the waters, as well as every winged fowl. God also said, Be fruitful and multiply in the earth. Genesis 1, 20, 22. On the fifth day, then God created the fish and the birds. Genesis 1, 20 to 23. The sixth day. The sixth day saw the creation of animals and humankind. God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Genesis 1.24 God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Genesis 1.26 Thus God created man in his own image, and he made both men male and female. God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat. Genesis 1, 28-30 Humankind then is the only creation of God commanded to have dominion over all creatures and to subdue the earth. Humankind is also the creation made in the image of God. Genesis 1, 24-31 The seventh day. On the seventh day of creation week, God rested. Genesis chapter 2, 1-3 Creation was complete and God's relationship with humankind was just beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about the power of choice. Sin breaks communion with God. The power of choice. Adam and Eve. Innocence. The second chapter of Genesis restates the creation of man and women and gives more specific details. This chapter also reveals that God planted a garden eastward in Eden where he placed the man Adam. The garden was a beautiful place growing every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for food. Into this paradise God put Adam with instructions for him to dress and keep the garden. So let's talk about the forbidden fruit. The forbidden fruit. The Lord had other commandments for Adam as well. He was 
not left to his own will. One thing was forbidden him. God said, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Genesis chapter 2, 16-17 Another unusual tree found in the garden was the tree of life. Genesis 2, 9 It was permissible for man to eat of that tree, but he was not to eat of the tree that would give him knowledge of good and evil. He was in a state of innocence. Eating of the tree would awaken his conscience. Eve given to Adam. The Lord had created Adam before Eve, and he noted that it was not good for man to be alone. God said, I will make him and help meet for him. Genesis 2.18 The words help meet are translated from one Hebrew word that means aid. The Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he took one of Adam's ribs from which he made man and woman. God brought the woman to Adam, and he said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Genesis 2, 20, 23. In their innocence, both Adam and Eve were unashamed though they were naked. Humankind gives free will. Some have wondered why God placed the forbidden tree in the garden. Would not it have been better if God had never given Adam and Eve their opportunity to do, do wrong? Now, these kind of questions overlook God's purpose in creating man. God did not create a puppet or a robot. He created a being with the power of choice or with a free will. God's promises are to whoever will, Revelation 22, 17. Would it be possible for God to have joyful fellowship with a being who had no choice in the matter? Who, in essence, was forced into that relationship? One of the major differences between humankind and the animal kingdom is the power of choice to do good or evil. From the first, God has set before man the ability to choose to do right and live, or choose to do wrong and die. Now, two brothers were born into a family long ago. John Calvin was studious, thoughtful, and respectful. At the early age of 27, he wrote one of the most influential books in Christendom, The Institute of the Christian Religion. The other brother, Charles, led a life in the gutters of immorality. What explains the difference between the two? Not heredity, environment, or education, for they grew up in the same home, with the same influences and opportunities. The difference is explained in the power of choice. So let's talk about the fall. Chapter 3 of Genesis outlines the terrible mistake that Adam and Eve made and its tragic consequences. Eve visits the forbidden tree. Evidently, one of the first mistakes that Eve made was to visit the site of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Since she knew that it was the forbidden tree, she should have avoided it altogether. She should have stayed away from it. Romans chapter 13 verse 14 commands, Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. A similar admonition is found in Ephesians 4.27, Neither give place to the devil. Many hurtful temptations could be avoided if people just stayed away from the sinful environments and comprising, compromising situations. Nevertheless, Eve, as have multitudes of people since then made the fatal error of knowingly and willingly making provision for the temptation. Now, Satan pays a visit also now. Satan, who is very subtle, was waiting for the right opportunity to inject his deceitful influence into the tranquil setting of the Garden of Eden. He knew that he had only one possible course of action, and that invoked the forbidden tree. It is important to notice that the first words that Satan said to Eve was, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden? 
Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, Satan's first method of attack is always to question God's word in a very sly and crafty way without actually denying God's word. He tempts humankind to question the word of God. Satan's wrong interpretation. Next, let us observe the difference in God's perspective and the devil's viewpoint by comparing word for word what each said. God said, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. That's Genesis chapter 2, 16-17. Satan asks if God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Genesis 3, 1. This change may seem to be just a matter of semantics or play on words, but when we are talking about the Word of God, every single word is crucial. The phrasing is critical, and the perspective is important. This truth cannot be overemphasized. Now, let us compare these statements again. God was speaking from a positive viewpoint. He told Adam that he could freely eat of every tree in the garden except for one. The serpent's viewpoint was negative. He focused on the fact that they could not eat of every tree. By doing so, Satan was attempting to make Eve feel deprived rather than blessed. He wanted her to think about that little bit she could not have rather than all that she could have. Time and time again, Satan uses this technique. We must also always watch for this tactic. Satan will quote something that sounds so much like the Word of God and is so close to what God actually said that he will fool those who do not know the Word themselves. Moreover, it is important to note that Satan actually questioned whether God had really given such a command or not. Eve's lack of knowledge of God's Word the next tragic step in this whole scenario is that Eve did not really know what God had said. Eve's statement sounds very close to what God said, but God forbids us to add or take away one word from what he said. Eve added to what God had said, and Genesis 3, 2-3, The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but... Of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Once again, let us compare this statement with what God actually said, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2, 16-17 God did not say, neither shall ye touch it. Again, at first glance, this addition may not seem important, but we are not dealing with the word of people. We are handling the word of God. And while it may seem that Eve strengthened God's commandment by adding a condition that he did not mention, we must realize that we cannot strengthen God's word. If we add our own conditions, we go beyond the word of God. By thus misquoting what the Lord had said, Eve revealed to the serpent a major flaw in her ability to resist temptation. A careful study of the temptation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 will further clarify this point. The only way to resist the temptation of Satan effectively is to respond to his efforts with the, the Word of God, the pure Word of God. As he did with Jesus, Satan will attempt to enhance his temptations with his version of God's Word. He misquoted and misapplied a verse from Psalm 91. Being the Word made flesh, Jesus caught him in his error and was not trapped. Satan is still in the business today of tripping up the unaware, the unwary, those who do not know for themselves what God actually said. Now, if Jesus were not too great to be tempted of Satan, neither are we. And we cannot vote the devil out of existence. If he is not around, someone is certainly doing his work. A young man once asked an older man, I suppose you no longer believe in the devil. I certainly do believe in the devil, the older man responded. If I didn't, I would have to believe that I was my own devil. 
<laughs> Funny, right? Satan attacks God's motives. The next step in his temptation of Eve was an attack on God's motives. Having discovered that she did not really know what God said, Satan now directly contradicts God's word. Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3, 4-5 In short, Satan caused Eve to think that God prohibited her, and Adam from eating the tree, he wanted to keep something good from them. This is another standard tool in the devil's kit. He tries to convince people that it would be to their advantage to do those things forbidden by God and that God actually does not want the best for them but wants to keep them in ignorance and in bondage. So Adam's disobedience, Eve took the next unhappy step down the road to spiritual death. She began to follow her physical desire instead of the word of God. She saw that the tree was good for food, the sight, the taste, and that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise and appeal to her pride. She ate the fruit and she gave some to Adam and he also ate. What makes all this even more tragic is that while Eve was deceived, Adam was not. He knew exactly what he was doing, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Now, in exploring God's word, we discover the following facts about the fall of man. By one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, Romans 5.12. Death came by sin, and so death passed upon all men, Romans 5.12. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, Romans 5.14. And by one man's, speaking of Adam, one man's offense, death reigned. Romans 5.17 Therefore, as by the offense of one, speaking of Adam, the offense of Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnations. Romans 5.18 For as by one man's sin, this one man Adam, dis disobedience, many were made sinner. Because of Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners, and after Adam and Eve ate the fruit, their eyes were open. They knew they were naked, and they tried to cover up their shame by sewing fig leaves together and making aprons. Clearly their conscience was awakened. The age of innocence was over. Wow. God comes walking in the garden. And, and, and look at this. God looks for Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And in their shame and remorse, they hid from the, his presence amongst the trees of the garden. Sin had broken their free relationship with God. So the Lord called, Where art thou? Genesis 3.9 Adam responded, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Genesis 3.10 God asked, Who told thee that thou, has, that thou was naked? Who told you you were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee thou should not eat thereof? Genesis 3.11 Adam and Eve, they begin to blame someone else immediately. At this juncture, another development occurred that is typical of all humankind from that time all the way to this time. Adam blamed his sin, his own sin, on someone else. He answered, God, the woman who thou gavest me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Genesis 3.12 the fallen nature of the humankind does not want to take responsibility for sin. This is why repentance is such a major step, and it's the main reason it is absolutely necessary. The same tendency is seen in Eve. God asked her, What is this that thou hast done? She said, Well, the serpent beguiled me, and, and I did eat. Genesis 3.13 So the blame game began. And to this day, you look at little babies and children, and when they get in trouble, the first thing they do is point a finger, and we didn't have to teach that to them. It's already engra engrafted inside of their conscience. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of this slide. I'm going to stop for a moment for a break.